Well, welcome right. everybody to the next iteration of the invasive pest municipal update, primarily for Emerald Ash Borer, but for many other things as well today. And hopefully um, you can keep yourself muted during this. And if you um, have a problem, you can try to email Amy Emery, and maybe she can help you out with that. And so getting started, uh, I'm going to start out with an update on our proposed quarantines. And oh, if you can't hear anything, then you probably need to double check your own settings on your laptop or computer to make sure that you are um, have your speakers live so you can so you can hear things. Otherwise, you might want to call in on the telephone number and maybe you could use your phone together with your computer to hear it that way. So I'm going to share my screen. Everybody see the right screen? Not hearing from anybody? Yes, you're sharing <laughs> like, your screen. Start right up now. <laughs> OK. <laughs> so I'm going to talk uh, about um, emerald ash borer, hemlock woolly adalgid, and European large canker. Uh, we We recently proposed expansions of the, the three quarantines that we've had in place for a number of years, especially for European large canker and hemlock woolly adelgid. And basically starting out with the uh, emerald ash borer quarantine, we have two sections of the state that are under quarantine, uh, far north in Aroostook County and in southern Maine. and. In the Aroostook County situation, we've added two new townships. Uh, you can see them in blue here. Uh, in these maps, if you look at the, the the darker red, those are kind of the locations where we've actually found the pest. And then around them is a, a about a ten mile um, addition, which is considered to be what we think to be the infested area. And then in the kind of purplish color, uh, you can see the existing quarantine area. And then the two blue squares are the new townships that are being considered for addition to the quarantine. So the quarantine basically requires that if you're going to move any material that might have emerald ash borer in it, including mixed firewood, hardwood firewood, uh, it doesn't have to just be ash. It can be any hardwood, firewood, or any ash logs that uh, you know might be moved or um, have bark material on them. If you are moving ash material that's been debarked, um, that is not going to be regulated um, anymore. And if you're moving live ash trees, uh, which you know most people aren't selling ash anymore because of the problem with emerald ash borer, but uh, movement of any of those materials outside of the quarantine would require either a compliance agreement with the Forest Service or with the, the horticulture uh, program. And uh, otherwise, you can't be moving those materials because they threat uh, moving emerald ash borer. And you can see the new townships are T16R8 and T16R9 that are being proposed to go into the quarantine, new quarantine. In southern Maine, it's uh, quite a bit different and quite a bit more movement. And unfortunately, that pretty much shows that we're moving it around ourselves, that emerald ash borer can't move this fast on its own. It generally only moves about two miles on its own where there's plenty of ash. If there's not much ash available, it might move as far as 10 miles, but generally it's not going to move um, that far. 
So if you um, again look at this map, you can see the the red spots where we you know think that it's generally infested, and then another ten miles around that where where it's probably potentially infested, and then you can see the existing quarantine that is in the the red down in the the lower left hand corner with all of York and Cumberland counties and part of Oxford County, and as you can see, it's moved very quickly in the last uh, couple of years. It moved, uh, you know, up into Lewiston Auburn area, then into the Oakland Waterville area, and then all the way up to Corinna Newport area. And the blue towns are the towns that uh, we are proposing to add to the quarantine. So it adds a number of of new counties, um, all of Androscoggin, Knox, Lincoln, Sagadahawk, and Waldo counties, plus 22 towns in Southern Franklin County, and all but seven uh, northern towns in Oxford County, and then 31 towns in Southern Penobscot County. So again, if this uh, proposed quarantine is adopted, then movement of any of those regulated materials would not be allowed. Um, in that situation to move out of those uh, quarantine areas into non-quarantine areas. We're hoping that this will help again to continue to slow it down. There's about 60% of the ash that's still uninfested as far as we know. This also includes what we call an exterior quarantine. So it's all of the, uh, the counties uh, of the United States that are considered infested. And then you can see also the a number of areas that are in um, in Canada as well. So there's a, a lot of new um, areas that are being added. And yeah, if I go back, um, I did not get in this list. Um, there's there's a few towns as well in Piscataquis County. So there's about um, I'd say 10, 11 towns in Piscataquis County that are being added as well. And then um, I just wanted to show how it has spread in the United States in just the last year. You can see on this uh, Forest Service USDA map where um, the, the counties that are in purple are the ones that um, have new infestations in, in 2023. So it's, it's moving both in Maine as well as moving out west uh, all the way into Colorado now and uh, right on the edge of the Dakotas and into Texas as well. So shifting gears and looking at uh, hemlock woolly adelgid, this uh, pest appears to be moving inland. It may or may not be related to climate change because this is a pest that um, you'll hear about later. It is affected by really cold winters and it should help to, to slow its spread um, just because of that. But this year we did find uh, a number of towns that were infested that are right on the edge of the existing quarantine. So you can see the, the regulated area that's been in place in blue, and you can see a number of towns in 2022, 2023 that are right on the edge of the quarantine border. And there were, uh, was a gardener uh, find that was outside of the quarantine. So we did need to propose uh, expanding that quarantine. You can see the proposed area in yellow on this uh, map, um, as well as you can see the in green where you know we find most of the hemlock. And so to slow this one down, um, you know, no movement of hemlock materials, especially the you know the, the needles and tops that are definitely where you're going to find the infestation. You can see a picture there in the upper left hand corner of the uh, little woolly adelgids uh, along the, the branch of the, the hemlock. And again, this is one that also it's important to you know do some trimming back in places. It's it can easily be moved on people on on uh, vehicles and other equipment. And one you may or may not have ever heard of is the European larch canker, and this is one that uh, has been um, in Maine. It, it came in from Atlantic Canada a number of years back. It's uh, been at a golf course in Brunswick for a number of years as well. And it usually um, we thought was going to kind of hug the coast and not move inland all that much because of the kind of um, weather requirements that it needs to be able to um, complete its life cycle. 
it is a canker disease. It's a fungal disease. You can see a, a, a picture of a twig that's got kind of these areas that are um, infested that become knobby and um, expand a little bit. And it was found in four new towns, um, inland Aurora, Lakeville, T28 and T30 MD. And so uh, again, we're proposing to add a number of towns to this quarantine uh, would require it not to be uh, moved out of there, any kind of large materials. And this one is actually also federally regulated. So we're working together with the USDA Animal Plant Health Inspection Service to have them um, change their quarantine at the same time. Um, theirs will lag behind ours um, once you know we've gone through the process and adopted the quarantine, then they'll they'll mimic it in their um, federal uh, order. And there are opportunities to comment on these proposals. There'll be uh, public hearings at two sites and a virtual option through teams like we're on today. Uh, September 6 will be the actual live uh, public hearings at 10 a.m. Um, you can go to the Forest Service Bolton Hill Regional Office or um, to the Forest Service Regional Office at the airport in Old Town if you want to be there in person or you can join uh, by teams as you do um, like this today. And you're not required to be at a public hearing or um, the virtual public hearing to provide comment. And you can comment anytime now between now and September 22nd at 5 p.m. So written comments can be um, sent to me at um, my email at gary.fish at maine.gov. And those count just as the same as any comments that are uh, accepted through the, the public hearings. Did recently find out from uh, Allison that there can be a FEMA assistance to towns. If there is a, a declared emergency, uh, FEMA may be able to help you um, with reimbursement for storm cleanup that will assist with quarantine compliance. So that's something just to keep in mind if we do have a, a big situation, especially with emerald ash borer, you can often see uh, uh, infested trees that are going to easily break a, apart and, and fall over. So if there's a, a need to do storm cleanup in that situation and potentially move that material outside of the quarantine area, then you may be able to get some reimbursement um, in that situation. So Allison, you want to add to that? Yeah, I just wanted to clarify a little bit. Um, so the assistance isn't particularly for compliance with the quarantine, but um, being eligible for assistance after a disaster declaration can be in jeopardy if you do not comply with those quarantine rules. And the reason I'm aware of this is because um, we had that huge storm in October of 2017 that many probably remember. And we, I had outreach at that time from FEMA staff. Well, not at that time, actually, like a year later when they were reviewing um, the assistance requests or the reimbursements requests to confirm that um, entities were following the, the quarantine rules. And the communication was that if they had not, then they would be in jeopardy of not qualifying for that um, reimbursement. So just that's something to be aware of a little bit extra <laughs> if in times of disaster. Thanks, Allison. I totally screwed it up, so thanks for correcting me. And um, with that, um, you can reach me at uh, my email or or you can call me uh, on the phone. And again, if you want to provide comment on any of those three proposed quarantines, you can send them all to uh, my email address. So with that, I'll stop sharing if I can figure out how to do that with this new setup. Mike, you might be able to just share your screen on and no, and I got it now. Okay. It's okay, just a new feature that just they just added yeah. with PowerPoint. All right, then assuming I am next. 
Yeah, and if anybody has any questions about what Gary presented, please feel free to raise your hand or jump in um, at this time. Yeah, I don't see any other questions at this time. So Mike Parisio from the Forest Service Entomologist will now um, present on Emerald Ash Borer and other, other things that we're doing in terms of how we're monitoring for them and, and surveying. OK, thanks, Gary. Good morning, everyone. Um, Gary showed you a bunch of maps. I'm going to keep the trend and show you another one. So this busy map here, um, hopefully folks can see my screen. It's just kind of a summary of all the things we're doing to monitor for Emerald Ash Borer. So I'll walk you through a couple of the programs that we uh, we run. So um, I'll start with purple prism traps. So that's by far the most numerous uh, trap type we have out there. So in 2023, we have about 192 out there on the landscape. And you can see those are distributed quite well throughout the state. Um, basically, those go up right around the time of emergence um, for um, emerald ash borer. And then they remain up through the flight season. So we start taking them down kind of late um, September when things are kind of wrapping up there. Um, and we change the lures and check them once in the middle of the summer. So. So we've done that part of the survey. Um, they were checked a few weeks ago. And so um, basically, if there's anything suspicious on those traps, it's collected and sent down to Augusta. So I've had a look at all the samples that were collected from those traps. And it was really just a few because um, folks are pretty good at picking out EAB now. So uh, there's very few lookalikes that aren't able to be diagnosed in the field. But long story short, we had no positive uh, purple prism traps for emerald ash borer during that mid-season check. So uh, yeah, as we roll into September, um, we'll start taking those down in a, uh, a couple weeks then and uh, checking them all again. So, and yeah, it's important to note with all that uh, trap set up and check and take down. You know, we visit all these sites three times, so uh, that really affords us a lot of opportunity for visual survey along the way. And so we uh, we do always keep an eye out while we're while we're driving for anything suspicious when it comes to ash shot. Um, aside from purple prism traps, another one of the um, monitoring tools we've been using that's been pretty successful for detections is girdle trap trees. Um, so again, some of you might be participating in pr that program, but basically it involves artificially wounding um, a small ash tree early on in the in the growing season before EAB emerges. And by the time EAB emerges, some of the chemical cues that that tree is giving off, um, indicating that it's kind of having a decline or a stress event, uh, makes it a little bit more attractive to, to emerald ash borer, and they might be more likely to, uh, you know, seek out those trees and uh, ovoposit on them. So. Um, those remain up throughout the flight season again while emerald ash borer is reproducing laying eggs um, and it gives them time uh, if they do lay eggs on any of those trees for the larvae to develop where they're detectable so uh, again probably you know a little bit later but into the fall here we'll start going out and cutting those down and those are you know destructively sampled trees so the tree gets cut down and then we peel uh, you know the the bark off to inspect for larvae and stuff like that so Again, kind of two core areas. We do a lot of work with that up north and then all kind of throughout the central uh, the central part of Maine there. So um, another thing we've been using, and this is kind of site dependent based on where we can find uh, the wasps, but uh, biosurveillance has been a pretty interesting program we've been participating in for a number of years. So it basically involves relying on a highly specialized predatory wasp that uh, they're ground nesting wasps and basically they uh, specifically target uh, buprestids or metallic wood boring beetles which is the family that emerald ash borer um, belongs to so uh, if you get lucky you can actually observe these wasps if they're in an infested area uh, bringing back uh, paralyzed emerald ash borer adults uh, for their young in the burrows so uh, yeah we've had some some success with this in past years they've had some success with new detections in some other states uh, with this program and uh, yeah it can be really applied wherever the uh, the wasps are uh, are present so they are kind of habitat specific their nesting areas require loose sandy soil so uh, a lot of the areas we target happen to be in things like abandoned uh, baseball diamonds and things like that or quarries and stuff so uh, yeah you can see uh, we these these sites kind of come and go um, around the state but 
um, wherever we can find colonies, we, we monitor them. And sometimes, you know, those colonies go away and we find new ones in other parts of the state. So, um, so that's what's going on for monitoring, you know, as far as physically looking for new areas with emerald ash borer. And you can kind of see, if you look at this map following the, the purple prism trap boundary, southern Maine here, um, you know, Cumberland County, York County, southern Oxford County. So those are the areas that are really thoroughly infested with emerald ash borer. And so because we know that, we don't really have to spend too much time monitoring there, but we can kind of move on to the next phase of emerald ash borer management. So that's biological control. So biological control for emerald ash borer is basically utilizing three um, tiny parasitoid wasp species from the native range of emerald ash borer and uh, releasing those to establish those in Maine where they can, uh, you know, they're highly specialized as well. So they really only go after emerald ash borer. So getting them established in our North American landscape um, so they can provide some low level of control for the future forest. Um, once emerald ash borer has eliminated a lot of our, our large ash, we're hopeful that these uh, parasitoid wasps can help protect some of the, the new generations of smaller trees that they're effective in protecting. And, and Maine is just one of many states. Um, I think uh, most of most states with emerald ash borer infestations, which is up into the the mid to high 30s now for the U.S., they're all participating in this program. So this is a massive national program to uh, get these things established. Um, but yeah, as I said, you know, we're kind of working on those in areas that are thoroughly infested. Um, one of the, the highlights or, you know, is we're able to uh, get a new site established and started right away with this Waterville detection from last year. So we're kind of moving, you know, some of these um, Bio lease, uh, bio, biological control release sites into the central part of the state, you know, again, as we, um, you know, have some of these satellite emerald ash borer infestations spring into the center of the state. So we're working on the Newport one this year, and we'll continue to, to work on those and getting new sites established wherever EAB is. So, um, yeah, with that, that's that's basically the sum of, of monitoring and management activities uh, that are, you know, prevalent for this year. So, um, if anybody has any questions about any of those, feel free. Otherwise, I'll pass it along to whoever's next. Okay, thanks, Mike. Um, any questions about any of that or anything else that's uh, already been covered? Allison, you have your hand up again? Yeah, I was just going to mention briefly um, the new detections since our last meeting. Um, I, I don't have a full list of them, but I know that one that was a little bit further out of um, on the edge of the uh, generally infested area that was known was Brunswick, um, was reported by a arborist and confirmed in early August. Just wanted to emphasize that. Yeah, and I didn't mention the ones that were in uh, more northern um, Oxford County as well. Right. All right, so were, go ahead. do you want me to share that map again real quick and point these out or? Sure, yeah. All right. Um, do, do. All right, so yeah, let me see if I can zoom in some more on these. If I can go onto the screen. So yeah, these uh, obviously we've had the existing regulatory regulatory area in pink here, but you know these are some of the uh, the satellite infestations that have kind of spurred this uh, need for uh, regulatory review. So obviously the big news last year was was Waterville and Lewis and Auburn pretty much simultaneously, but then yeah, this year we've had uh, things as far up as Andover. Um, late winter, um, this is Bryant Pond, Woodstock area, I believe. And then, yeah, as Allison just mentioned, oh yeah, Corin and Newport was uh, another one this year. And then, yeah, the most recent, just very recently, um, still within the the regulated area there, but right on the on the border. So uh, again, and if that spills over into Bath um, from Brunswick, you know, we're talking about a new county there. So, so yeah, these are some of the the main driving forces for the reason for this uh, revision of the the regulated area. All right, thanks, Mike. So I did put a number of uh, links in the in the chat, um, including the CEU um, credit for pesticide licenses is there. Um, Amy had done it earlier, but 
I did it again just in case people joined afterwards. And then there was a couple of links there on the biocontrol as well as some information on trap trees, the trap tree network. So it looks like we have a hand up, Gary. Pat Cat Taylor. Taylor. Um, Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Uh, could you bring that map back up, please? The the one the one you just showed. Okay. Um, you'll see on the right hand side in the upper right hand in Penobscot County that irregularly shaped township. That's Argyle. It looks like a funnel, kind of, with ragged. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. I think you have to. Okay. It, kind of switch maps on me, I think. But anyway. Oh, this is this is zoomed in. I was zooming yeah, out to that, Argyle here. That's okay. Uh because okay. <laughs> you know, a little motion sickness here. Thank you. Oh I'm sorry. That's okay. Um to the right of that is the Penobscot River. Yep. And and you have the division at the Penobscot River. Uh a lot of people in my neighborhood have their own tree lots. And so it's we wonder why um, the the emerald ash borer is stopping at the river and why it isn't continued over to Greenbush, Milford, and Bradley, since uh, most of our weather is from the west. And so it would make sense that it would cross the river. Uh, I'm wondering how you obtain, is this from the traps? Because I think I saw one of the traps, the prism traps, in the lower right-hand side of Argyle. I don't know if it was in Argyle or maybe in Old Town along the edge there, you said you, you need sandy soil. Um, was there, I guess my question is, were there traps set in Argyle? And why are we stopping at the Penobscot River? Because we have customers across the river who would buy firewood normally, and now local uh, hard, uh, hardwood and softwood providers are like basically forbidden to cross the river. So I'm wondering what the, the logic is with that. Well, I can explain that. So when we propose a quarantine like this, we we add buffer area from where the infestation is. So the closest infestation to that area is, you know, back down in the Newport Corinna area. And generally we add a at least a two town buffer from what might be the potentially infested area. So in this situation, you can see it's it's a little more than two towns, but um, it is um, what we think is the you know adequate buffer at this point. And because this is a proposed quarantine, um, that provides the opportunity for firewood sellers or others that might be moving potentially infested material to make comments and then you know we'll have to look at those comments and make decisions uh, you know based on them it's up to the uh, commissioner of the department as well as the uh, assistant attorney general that we work with to decide if the comments are significant enough to make a change and in some situations if we do end up having to make a change we may put it back out for additional public comment and that's the way that the Administrative Procedures Act works. And, you know, we have to follow that law very carefully to uh, make sure that we are uh, adopting changes like this appropriately. So then Argyle is not included in the quarantine area at this time or people restricted from selling firewood to people in Milford or or Howland? So currently it's not part of the quarantine. So there, there is an emergency order that was put out by the, the Forest Service that um, I believe does include that area. Um, so there is an established um, emergency order that would have the same effect as the quarantine. And the emergency order is put in place because of, um, you know, a find and it's, oftentimes a little more restrictive than the actual quarantine would be. And in this situation, it is the area that's under emergency order is, is larger than the area of the proposed quarantine. I don't know, Mike, do you have that map handy anywhere? Or? 
I don't, but it's on my wall. So uh, yeah, the current emergency order, um, Milford is included, then it goes across the river. So Argyle and Edinburgh above, but Passadum, Keg, and Greenbush are not in the current emergency order, um, nor would they, uh, would they be in this uh, proposed uh, change as well. So how would just the usual woodlot owner, you know, selling firewood know about the emergency order? Well, the emergency order was definitely, um, you know, sent out through um, press releases and and um, I'm sure that the Forest Service also, you know, made people aware of it through their own mailing lists. Um, I can actually share the. I'm bringing it up, Karen. OK. So this is yeah the current emergency order area, which is larger than the proposed quarantine area. Okay, when would the uh, so we're having the public hearing on the sixth, public comments until what the twenty eighth, the twenty second, twenty second, and I wrote it down. So um, so then about how long will it take after that for you to just I, I'm the reason I'm asking is. I live next to a forest ranger, you know, and I actually talked to Allison Canuti about uh, the, the emerald ash borer spread and other, you know, invasive species up towards this area, I think about a year and a half ago, and you didn't have the new maps yet. So I applaud you on that, that you have new mapping. That's wonderful. Um, one of the other things I was concerned about is I did a map and I'll email it to you. I have Gary and Allison's email address and the rest of you are missing in action on the DAFS or C website staff directory. So if you want to share your email addresses in the chat, that would be great. Um, I've located the landfills that are coming up the state up the I-95 corridor, and it seems to be a correlation between all of the landfills and the fact that there were, we're bringing in out-of-state waste from quarantine areas uh, in construction and demolition debris and municipal solid waste for commercial landfills. So at the time, there was not enough money or staffing to investigate this. Uh, but now I'm wondering if, because this has spread so quickly so far, that if that's something that you would look into as far as uh, we're having people inspect their camping gear and washing their boats and drying their boats to avoid invasive species spread, and yet we're allowing, you know, millions of tons of garbage and, and construction debris to come into the state uninspected, unprocessed, so I'm wondering if that might actually have an impact, especially since they've ramped up the import of, of waste into our state, if that might, there might be a link between the two. Uh, and also I have a whole bunch of beautiful young ash trees on my property that I would like to prevent from getting infected. Uh, is there somebody who could help me? I would like to become part of the, um, the surveying you know, the traps and such. I have enough ash trees to where I could sacrifice one for girdling. And also I'd like to be able to set out some prism traps to see if I have a, I have not seen sign yet, uh, but I, you know, would rather prevent it rather than fix it afterwards, so. Well, I'm sure that you can, you know, become part of the trap tree network and, and do other things like that. Unfortunately, as far as protecting your ash trees, that's something that you're gonna have to do on your own um, and if you have specific ash trees that you're going to want to save then you're going to have to treat them with insecticides to prevent them from you know being infested and and potentially dying from it because this is something that is just going to continue to spread there's no way to uh, stop it in especially the forest situation and unfortunately that's been the history you know since 2000, you know, maybe even the the late 1990s from Detroit all the way across the country. And, and unless somebody comes up with a new silver bullet, um, we're not going to be able to prevent that from making its way across the state of Maine as well. Well, do you think there might be a correlation between, since we're looking at invasive species being spread by camping gear and, and recreational vehicles, that there actually might be a link between bringing in um, out-of-state waste into Maine uh, without having any inspections done. For emerald ash borer, I think that's probably unlikely. 
Um, you know, if they're bringing in a lot of storm debris or something like that, then that could potentially be a, a situation. But with just regular trash, um, pretty unlikely. And construction and demolition debris, I mean, isn't it? Even that as well. So construction and demolition debris would not have um, the, the right kind of, of uh, material in it that would have, you know, ash that was alive at the time and uh, with bark on it and stuff like that. It's it's just, you know, that's that's much less likely if they're bringing in a whole bunch of pallets that maybe weren't uh, potentially treated, that could be a problem, but there is a a fairly um, you know standard treatment for pallets these days, and hopefully that is helping to reduce the the potential problem. Okay, thank you. I appreciate your advice. I think I'll go sure. with the wasp group. That sounds like a little more natural. You know, I have a nice monarch colony. I'd rather not put pesticides on the trees. But thank you very much. Right. So the the treatment for emerald ash borer is actually you know in, injected into the tree. So monarchs wouldn't be a concern in that situation. Um, you know when the ash trees are flowering, the monarchs aren't around. But let's move on. Um, I don't see any other hands up. So the the next uh, presentation is Colleen Tierling. She's going to give an update on uh, hemlock woolly adelgid. Okay, you guys see my uh, my presentation? Yep, looks good. Okay. So I'm going to be talking a little bit about managing hemlock woolly adelgid, um, things that you can do to help slow the spread or deal with it when you do have hemlock woolly adelgid, because um, as Gary has shown, that this is something that is definitely expanding over the recent years. Um, so what adelgid is, it's a small aphid-like creature is somewhat related to aphids. Um, it feeds only on hemlock trees. It covers itself with this white woolly um, material, which is a, a sort of a wax that it extrudes to uh, protect itself. It's on the undersides of the twigs, at the base of the needles, and, and on the newer growth. Uh, so that is how you can, how you can um, identify it. If you were to look underneath one of those white woolly masses, you would see that there is a female underneath there and she will lay her eggs all covered by this waxy wool. Um, there's one adult per woolly mass. She can lay up to about 300 eggs. And every adelgid out there that you see on hemlock tree is a female. They don't need to mate. Um, every single one is capable of, of producing uh, eggs. And so the potential for for huge expansive you know explosive expansion is 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 pretty great the main way that adelgids spread is through the crawlers um in fact yeah pretty much the entire way of uh, there are they do not fly um except for a sort of a dead end uh, part of the generation that uh dies out and 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 does not have the right host so the for on hemlock trees they do not fly the only mobile state is the crawlers um and they are around for between march and july is a pretty high risk of finding crawlers and eggs um so again if, if you look at under the wool those eggs when they hatch that first stage is mobile they can crawl around they're very very tiny as you can see here that's the base of a hemlock needle and, and those are some of the crawlers so very very small essentially impossible to see for most people unless you've got a hand lens or very very good eyes um and um they can rain out of the tree they can get picked up when when people brush up against a tree or equipment or anything brushes up against a tree and um, they can also fall out of the tree onto equipment and vehicles. Uh, this is a spread, uh, um, a sheet that beating sheet that we put underneath a tree, and we tapped a, a branch to see what would come out. It doesn't really look like there's much there other than some needles and twigs. But when you look closer, you can see that all those teeny tiny little specks. Those are all the crawlers that just drain down out of the tree, and that is the the main way that they spread around from tree to tree. Um, and so just very briefly, the life cycle, there is, as I said, two generations a year in the, um, so where we are right now, we're in August. Um, the crawlers 
uh, that that were around earlier in the in the summer have settled now into their their feeding locations and they are attached to the tree. They're not going to move. And so now we are in a safe period of time where when it is safe to do work in trees and you're not going to be spreading the, the crawlers around. And so they are right now in a sort of a hibernation called estivation. Um, and then in the fall, they will start to feed, put on their own wool and then late um, or early winter, they will be starting to lay eggs. And by the end of February, they are going to be starting to lay their own eggs. And that's when we get into that high risk period again. Um, so that's that long, slow winter generation. And then we go into the um, the the quicker generation that that happens in the spring and early summer. And so those eggs that will be laid at, at the end of February, um, beginning of March um, will be starting, will start to hatch into crawlers and we will have a, a generation where they go through the nymphal stage and, and to laying eggs again. And this, ge this generation is so quick that um, the generate, the life stages can overlap. So there's at any point in time during this red period from March to July, there's a good chance that either crawlers or eggs will be present. And so we consider that to be a high risk period when it's very easy to move, move uh, adelgids around. All right. So yeah, the most, one of the most important things, parts of, of an integrated pest management is, um, is monitoring because if you know where something is then you can act intelligently so you can monitor at at any time of the year but you need to be aware that you can move crawlers around from march to july and so just just be aware of that um, and and act accordingly um, early winter is probably the often the easiest time to monitor that's when the um when the the that what those white woolly masses are are the most visible, but you can look even at this time of year. Just be aware that if we've had a lot of rain like we had this year, some of those old woolly masses will start to break down and look kind of ragged. Um, so it won't be quite as easy. Where you um, basically you can monitor anywhere that there are hemlocks, but you want to especially look at high risk areas, and I'll talk a little, little bit about that later. Um, roads, trails, parking lots, edges. And how just flip over the twigs and look at new growth, which is pretty pretty straightforward to look for those those white woolly masses. Um, so high risk areas, uh, because it's the uh, the crawlers that get moved around. It's you want to look at places where they can be moved around by wind, so along wind corridors, like along rivers and roads. Um, edges where vehicles may have brushed up against hemlock trees, edges of parking lots, trails where people and animals can can brush up against hemlock trees and move those crawlers around. So basically anything that hemlock trees may be touched by people or vehicles or animals or birds, because um, we know birds will move them around as well. So those are some of the high risk areas, but you want to basically look anywhere, anywhere that if you're out in the woods, you can go looking at hemlock trees as you're hiking along. And if there's hemlock trees are too tall, you can look at the at the understory. Um, look at trees that have hemlock trees that have fallen down. That'll give you a picture of what's happening up in the canopy. Or, you know, let porcupines help you in the winter when when little twigs and get, branches get uh, get uh, dropped down to the ground. Take a look at those as well. Um, and that will tell you a, a bit of what's happening up in the canopy where you can't see. And um, just quick, some search images of what hemlock woolly adelgid looks like. Here's a heavy infestation. Uh, here is a lighter infestation. Um, and this is a quite a light infestation. You can see just a few um, few woolly masses on this new growth up here. Uh, this is what we might see at this time of year. That older wool is looking kind of ragged. Um, and here we actually also have some elongate hemlock scales on the needles. Um, and then again, this is what um, this is what the the, craw the settled crawlers look like. Um, and if you get it, zoom in a little closer, you can see that those those crawlers have settled and they're now settled nymphs um, right at the base of the needles, looking very small. So um, other things you can do besides monitoring. The pruning of high risk foliage is really important. Um, and by high risk foliage is the things I talked about earlier, anywhere where hemlock trees will brush up against vehicles, equipment, 
cars, even people mowing the edges of their lawns. And um, one of the first things that any park or any town does when they when they first get hemlock woolly adelgas is they start to you know prune back some of their their hemlock trees um, in those high risk areas, and that's really really important. But it's even more important if you're in a town that does not have hemlock woolly adelgid or in an area that does not have hemlock woolly adelgid. You want to prune those high risk trees as well so that when somebody comes from a coastal area that's got hemlock woolly adelgid on their equipment or their cars um, or in, you know, even on their, their hat as they're hiking through a trail, they're not going to um, transmit crawlers to your clean trees, your uninfested trees. So one of the most important things you can do is prune your hemlock trees. Uh, and then this just shows from Fry Island. This is a picture that just really graphically illustrates that. All of these dark green trees around here are hemlock trees um, that were that were back in an area where they were not brushing up against vehicles. Uh, this right here is also a hemlock tree. And all those other hemlock trees, I couldn't find a single, um, a single uh, hemlock woolly adelgid on those trees. They were really clean at that point in time, but this tree was practically dead from hemlock woolly adelgid because it was hanging over this, this laneway and got brushed up against by, uh, by public works vehicles and other vehicles that were carrying crawlers. So it is really, it is something that is an important thing that you can do to help, help slow down the spread to um, your area. Uh, and then also just ti the timing of your work is important. August to February, that is when we are in the low risk period, when um, we have very little risk of moving hemlock woolly adelgid crawlers around on, on equipment. And so that is the time to do major work on your trees. Biological control is something that in the right situation can be um, can be used. The state is 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 doing biological control. The two species of Laracobius are are ones that we have released and and are releasing. Um, that they are not available um, commercially, but the Sagiscum nasuge, that third one there, is commercially produced and can be bought. And um, the last few years, we've had a huge interest. In, in from land trusts and from towns and cities and parks that are buying these, these predators and releasing them. There is no guarantee that they will work. This is a biological system. Um, and we, we do know that they feed on, on Adelgid. It's really hard for us to say um, what time frame over what time frame they will work and you know how much they will actually reduce the population of hemlock woolly adelgid we just don't have that kind of information so Maine Forest Service doesn't go to people and say yes you should spend your hard word money hard earned money on on buying these predators but if there is interest we will certainly support people and we'll help you find uh good sites and and help you release them to so that they uh have their best chance of, of being successful um, and so, yeah, we're seeing more and more of these being being released, even though there is no guarantee of what exactly they will do. It is pretty much the only really long term hope for hemlock woolly adelgid in our forested areas. There are pesticides that can be used. Um, you know, the the main organic option is using horticultural oil for trees that are small enough that you can get a, a good coverage because you basically need to smother the um, smother the insects um, and you need to to use those fairly frequently then there are also systemics and those are primarily neonicotinoids um, which have a bad reputation and in some cases well deserved but um, they can be used relatively it, with relatively little environmental contamination on on uh, hemlocks um, because they are either injected into the hemlock trees or can be injected into the hemlock trees or or sprayed along the base of the trunk. Um, and in, in those situations, they, the insecticide stays fairly, fairly exclusively in the tree and there should be relatively little environmental contamination. Um, it does kill all the insects that are feeding on that tree and turns that tree into a food desert. Um, and there are limits as to the number of trees you can treat per acre, but this can uh, protect trees and trees can recover even if they're starting to decline. 
and uh, biological control can and can be integrated with chemical control. And I will hopefully be um, putting together a talk this fall winter for pesticide applicators who are potentially interested in doing this, um, doing chemical control in the presence of biological control so that you can treat trees and keep them alive longer um, without um, damaging or killing any of your very or many of your very, very precious and expensive biological control. Um, so I just wanted to put that out there. Um, what about the cold weather that we had this last winter? We had, it was a relatively mild winter, but we had a couple of rather extreme cold snaps and we did see a fair bit of mortality. In some areas, not as high as we expected. In some areas we got like 99, even 100% mortality, which sounds like a lot. But then if you remember that every single fem every single adult out there is a female and is capable of laying up to 300 eggs, um, depending on which generation she's in, uh, the population rebound is going to happen really relatively quickly. Um, and so we are seeing in some areas that the trees are getting a little bit of a respite. Um, but we fully expect that that, uh, you know, because we do not get record breaking cold snaps like we have had um, that last winter, that the trees, the adult populations are going to be coming back fairly, fairly quickly. And so if you remember one thing, well, actually, I lied two things. The high risk time is March to July. Be aware that that's when the crawlers are present and you do not want to move those crawlers around um, because slowing the spread is one of the best things you can do for an invasive species. And then, you know, if there's one other action you're gonna do is prune your high risk trees. So areas where they are at high risk of being uh, brushed up against by vehicles or people, um, equipment, prune the, those trees back so they don't brush up against against equipment. And that's all that I have. All right, thanks, Colleen. Anybody have questions about hemlock woolly adelgid? You can raise your hand and then take yourself off mute. Right, seeing none. So uh, next presenter is Allison Kenodi, and she's going to talk about the one pest here that we don't have yet and hope we don't get is Asian longhorn beetle. Thanks, Gary. Um, I try to share my screen. You just let me know if folks are seeing that. I'm a little bit nervous because yep. some of yep. the slides have been it. lagging. It's showing. Okay, awesome. Uh, now let's see if I can find it on my. Other screen. Okay. Still showing good? Yep. All right. Yes. So um, I just wanted to talk a little bit about Asian longhorn beetle in this meeting, as we have done in previous years, uh, because August has been declared tree check month because of Asian longhorn beetle by the USDA APHIS Animal Plant Health Inspection Service. And the reason is that um, most Asian longhorn beetle infestations in the US have been reported in August, and that's due, you know, in part to the life cycle of the insect. It would be an adult right now, so those adults would be uh, present. The host trees are really um, moving a lot of uh, material up and down between the, you know, their roots and their leaves, and so there's a lot of potential for sap to be dripping off the trees. The activity of the larvae is showing um, frass from the feeding uh, that's happening inside the trees. So August is a great time to take um, to take a look at the trees that are hosts to Asian longhorn beetle. And it's also um, a good time to promote awareness of Asian longhorn beetle, but there, there are opportunities throughout the year for that. And there are a few places in Maine that are um, promoting Asian longhorn beetle awareness. That includes the Soil and Water Conservation District social media pages, as well as Maine Bug Watch, which is run um, right out of Gary's shop. And uh, then nationally, uh, there are a couple of social media presence. They include things like Hungry Pests, which is part of USDA APHIS, and the Don't Move Firewood campaign. So we do encourage folks to help us promote awareness of Asian longhorn beetle because it is a pest that is a threat to all of our hardwood forests and street trees. 
So as far as where has Asian longhorn beetle been found in the U.S., this map is as of January 2023. Um, there are not uh, new detections in the U.S. since then. However, there may have been uh, adults seen since then. So where it says, for instance, that Hollywood, South Carolina, down on the bottom of the map, the last detection of adults was January 2023 that may not be um, correct. And similarly with, um, with Ohio. So just to be aware of that. So you can see that in the US we had detections in um, places like Illinois where Asian longhorn beetle has been eradicated, uh, New Jersey again where it's been eradicated, Boston where it's been eradicated, and other areas, parts of New York and Ohio. And then we have detections where Asian longhorn beetles still uh, has not been eradicated, places like Worcester, Massachusetts, which is the closest infestation to Maine, um, parts of New York and uh, South Carolina and Ohio. And we'll just look at each of those just a little bit more closely. In Massachusetts, there's a 110 square mile quarantine area that centers around Worcester, Massachusetts. Um, and that infestation was probably present for a couple of decades before it was actually identified by a citizen in August of um, 2008, I believe. So it had been around for quite a while and somebody noticed the adult beetles in August, early August of 2008. And then, um, Moving towards the right, um, this is the quarantine area in New York. It's a little hard to see on the map on my screen. I assume it probably even harder for folks in the audience, but this is part of um, sort of the Long Island, New York area. And you can see the last detection was November 2022. That's actually an area where we expect there's going to be a real push towards eradication coming up, um, and we hope to be able to help through the Northeast Fire compact forest health working team with those eradication efforts. Um, in this case, it's more intensive survey, so more, more bodies out there to look at host trees. Um, and then Ohio infestation, it's a 49 square mile area, and there were detections this, this year. So it is an area that's probably not as close to eradication. And similarly with South Carolina, it's just over 76 square mile area of quarantine and the, the last detection was also this year, so not, not close to eradication. So how does Asian longhorn beetle spread? It is a wood boring insect. It can live both uh, inside in just underneath the bark of the tree as a young larva and deeper in the wood as it matures. And so it can be moved on things like firewood probably introduced um, to the U.S. on solid wood packing material of some sort. Um, it can also be moved in tree trimmings and woody debris. The picture on the right is actually a picture of the marshalling yard where infested material or host material is brought in to uh, a centrally located area in Worcester. So that's, that's around 2009, I believe, um, the marshalling yard in Worcester, Massachusetts. You can see this is a type of material that Asian longhorn beetle can move on, but it can also move on firewood, on sawn wood, um, as well as uh, as uh, as well as the firewood and, and those sorts of materials. So what are the host plants? I guess this doesn't really uh, come through as well as I'd hoped it would, uh, but primarily the preferred hosts in the United States include maple. Horse chestnut, which we have in Maine just as a, a planted tree. We don't have any native buckeye in Maine. Uh, we do have planted buckeye as well. Um, birch, willow, and elm. So those are the primary hosts of Asian longhorn beetle, with maple probably being the very favorite. And so that's why I have that picture of the sugar maple on the back of the, the slide. And then less preferred include a whole number of other genera of hardwood trees and shrubs. So just be aware that Asian longhorn beetle is something that's going to be attacking hardwoods. Um, a lot of the uh, wood boring insects that we see in Maine most frequently are insects of softwood trees and shrubs or softwood trees, I guess. 
So how do you recognize the Asian longhorn beetle? It's a large uh, longhorn beetle. Longhorn beetles have long antennae, which you can see in this slide here, the female and then the male, both having long striped antennae. They are shiny black, kind of like a patent leather shoe color. They have white markings both uh, on their wing covers, but also on their antennae. And when they are um, fresh, they have this uh, blue tinge on their legs from feti on the legs. And there is a native insect that looks really similar, and that's the white spotted sawyer. This is probably one that's most frequently mistaken for Asian longhorn beetle here in Maine. And one of the things that can help to tell the two apart is the coloration of the of the body. So on the Asian longhorn beetle, I mentioned already, it's kind of like a patent leather back, leather black, whereas in the white spotted sawyer, it's more of a bronzy black. It's not quite as apparent in this picture as it is in some of the specimens that you'll see in real life. Um, and it's likely if you've hung out around softwood in Maine um, that you have seen these white spotted sawyers. Uh, some folks call them chip lifters or wood chippers. Um, they have a, also this sort of heart-shaped mark that's their scutellum, right kind of at the base of uh, what would be kind of the top of the shoulders if it was on a person. Um, there are species that are related to the Asian longhorn beetle, such as the citrus longhorn beetle, that are, would also be invasive if they were found in the state that do not have that do also have that white scutellum. So we really encourage folks to, to look at the coloration. And also another thing is kind of the dimples that you see on those wing covers. There's a lot more um, on the white spotted sawyers versus the Asian longhorn beetle much more smooth wing covers on the Asian longhorn beetle. And if you have any doubt, um, take a picture, collect a sample, uh, definitely mark where it is that you saw uh, the insect that you thought may have been Asian longhorn beetle. Because there are a number of things that people do mistake for Asian longhorn beetle. They include a number of our other longhorn beetles, as well as um, other insects that are of similar color, like the idolator or um, similar size and shape, like the broadneck root borer, and even insects that are pretty dissimilar, like the Western conifer seed bug. So again, if there's any doubt, try to collect a picture and also a sample of the beetle. Um, you can store them if you don't want them to perish. You can store them in your refrigerator for a while and reach out uh, to report them. Or if you are uh, less inclined to keep them alive, you can put them in your freezer. Uh, make sure that if they are not in the fridge or freezer, that they're in a real sturdy container. I mentioned some of the signs of attack of Asian longhorn beetle. I'll just go through them a little bit more. Um, what you might notice in urban trees. On the left is a picture from Robert Childs. This was from an ice storm in 2008. That, or, yeah, 2008. It occurred just after uh, the detection of Asian longhorn beetle in Worcester and kind of pretty immediately gave uh, a better idea of where that pest was because there was a lot of tree breakage from the damage caused by Asian longhorn beetle. So one of the things you'll notice here is the tunneling um, inside the, the center of the tree. There's also not real visible um, with this light, but you can see some of the egg niches, which are here, and also exit holes. But with, with the way the photo is, um, a little bit dark. You can't really see those quite as well. So the female will chew an egg niche into the tree where she may deposit an egg. She may not. And then after the larva de develops inside of the heart of the tree, you get these perfectly round exit holes that are about just over the diameter of a pencil. Um, and a pencil will go into those holes, uh, usually a half inch to an inch anyways, straight out of the trunk. So this just shows you a little bit more of that dam some of the damage you can expect. As I mentioned early on, the larvae are just beneath the bark. So you'll see tunnels right on the outer surfaces of the wood and also areas of missing bark. Um, they will tunnel into the heartwood. Sometimes you'll get staining uh, associated with that. And the exit holes, you can see here, this exit hole is just the diameter of a Sharpie. So it gives you an idea of the size of those exit holes and also some more of the damage that you might expect to see on infested trees. And then finally, just wanna mention again, the things that you might see this time of year include the adults. 
but also the frass, which is a sawdust-like material that accumulates on sort of flat surfaces on the trees and also underneath the trees. It's apparently how the infestation uh, around Boston was recognized was the piles of frass underneath the trees at the hospital. And in Boston, I'll mention that that infestation was probably only a couple of years established. And I think they removed something like four trees and the, the infestation was eradicated. So it, it is possible to eradicate the infestations very quickly if the insect is found quickly. And that's why your help and education, education about this pest is so important. So again, August is tree, is tree check month, and that's because of the uh, frequent detections of Asian longhorn beetle during the month of August. And we do encourage you to help us promote public awareness, but also to integrate tree checks into your work year round. You know, some of those signs are gonna be present regardless of the time of year. They'll be more visible sometimes of the year than others, um, but you should be able to see things like the exit holes, um, the egg niches and the tunnels in the wood year round. And then finally, something, uh, a strategy for um, helping with Asian longhorn beetle as far as avoiding damage should it be uh, introduced into Maine would be to diversify plantings. And I will mention that, you know, the risk is fairly high in Maine. We are really close to the Worcester infestation, you know, just a few hour drive from the Worcester infestation. We have a lot of um, the favored trees here in Maine. Actually, the northern hardwood forest type is one of our most abundant forests in the state. We also have a lot of maples as street trees here in the state. So there is a high risk from the perspective of there being a lot of host, but also, as I had mentioned earlier, it can be introduced on firewood. And uh, we certainly have a lot of firewood moved for recreation um, throughout the state of Maine, almost anywhere you go. People probably lugged firewood, and, and in almost any region, they probably lugged it from the Worcester area sometime between the late 90s and the early 2000s. So if you do think you've seen Asian longhorn bee, feel, excuse me, you can go to maine.gov slash ALB. You do want to make sure you record exactly where it was seen. If you can capture the insect um, physically, then that's, that's wonderful. Um, if you can take pictures, even bad pictures can help us either uh, confirm that there needs to be follow-up or um, assure folks that it's something else. And, you know, you can work, report it quite easily at this website, maine.gov slash ALB. And I think I do have just a little bit of time. And so I'm going to just do a little bonus spotlight, and that's on the spotted lanternfly. Um, so the reason that I wanted to bring this up is because August is also a good time of year to spot this pest. And so the spotted lanternfly, we know it has hitchhiked to Maine, at least hitchhiked into Maine on, on trees, but also with human travelers and, and also on goods. Um, as far as uh, potential presence, the climate would allow establishment of this pest um, and potential proliferation, especially along the coast. So it's an insect that you would expect to find um, more readily established in the warmer coastal areas of the state and not so much as you get further inland. And so this time of year, you would try to spot the adults and the egg masses. Um, the nymphs are also spotted, but uh, they're present earlier in the year. And you would look for, we also encourage you to look for the preferred host tree, which is in flower or fruit this time of year, um, the tree of heaven. It's not well known in many locations of the state, but it is something that is established in small populations. And we'd love to know if you do see tree of heaven in the state, you can report it um, to either Bug Watch or uh, to Forest Health at Maine.gov. And I think that's what I have. And I can stop sharing my screen once I find the teams. There we go. All right, thank you, Allison. So any questions about Asian longhorn beetle or spotted lanternfly? Okay, Mark. Go ahead and unmute yourself. Sorry about that. Um, 
are we likely to see um, spotted lantern fly on um, species and subspecies of apple if we don't have like a, a very robust tree of heaven population in, in an area? So they will go to apple. Um, I don't think they can complete their full life cycle on just apple. There's still a lot of research being done to try to figure out what they can complete their life cycle on. It looks like maybe black walnut and, of course, Alanthus tree of heaven and maybe red maple, but those um, species are still, you know, kind of not being shown to provide the resources that the young or the uh, the gravid female needs to have enough nutrition to lay enough eggs so it's it's still kind of up in the air but they certainly will go to apple trees they'll go to hundreds of different plants to get their sugar resources from but in terms of being able to reproduce they seem to need to go at the end to Alanthus. Any other questions about Asian longhorn beetle or spotted lanternfly? You know, I would say that our biggest concern with spotted lanternfly would be for those vineyards that we have. We don't have many, but we do have a few. And they certainly have a, a pretty profound impact on grape growing um, unless they are well managed and taken care of early on in the infestation, they can pretty much cause mortality of, of grape vines. They don't seem to cause mortality in most other plants other than Alanthus, but they certainly can impact all those other species as well. Any other questions about those? I was thinking I wanted to just um, share the um, the map. I can find that file. Well, let me go back to this. And I just wanted to share this map again just to show because I didn't really talk about it during my quarantine talk to show that currently the area that's in yellow is what is sort of under quarantine now because of the emergency order from the Forest Service. So just so that you're aware that it's in all of these areas that movement of any of those regulated materials, the the ash logs, the mixed firewood, hardwood firewood, the um, live ash or any other portions of ash that still have the bark on them that would be would be regulated. And I just wanted to kind of touch on that one more time. And I don't see any other hands up at this point. So I guess Allison, you were going to do a, a a kind of a finishing Recap, I guess. Yeah. Um, so I just wanted to um, thank everybody for joining us today and uh, reiterate as far as uh, those who are here for pesticide credits. There is a credit quiz online that's been posted a number of times. Um, in order to receive the credit, you need to pass the quiz. And actually, there needs to be evidence of attendance of the meeting as well. Um, which we can get through through the meeting log. Um, I want to uh, also remind folks that we do have a public hearing next week on Wednesday from uh, beginning at 10 o'clock in both Old Town and Augusta, as well as on Teams. And um, that information can be found on the department calendar. Um, and then let folks know that our next scheduled meeting for this group is going to be in December of 2023. Encourage you to sign up for um, our lists, our um, 
bulletins in order to receive that update directly as to when that will be. And so that will be advertised in the conditions reports. It gets advertised in the project canopy postings, um, as well as in the main forest service lists and numerous of the horticulture lists as well. So if you were to sign up for any one of those newsletters, you get an opportunity to sign up for uh, any department newsletters at that time. So, so please do, if you want to have that advance notice, uh, aside from just checking emails or being lucky about seeing news reports, um, then that's the best place to do it. Um, anything else, Gary, or others? So yeah, I did add a link to the bulletin on the quarantine, so you can get the uh, the link to the the team's virtual hearing, as well as the information about where the the actual um, in person hearings are. And um, yeah, I just wanted to again ask if there are questions about any of the past that we've talked about or anything else. And I see a hand up on with Sharon. Go ahead and unmute yourself and. <clears throat> Yeah, I'm on here as Sharon Green. My office <laughs> manager set it up while I was working, but I I filled out the pesticide credit quiz as Nathan Talbot and put all my information in it. Is that going to be a problem? No, that should uh, be fine. All right, thank no, you. No, that's fine. Uh, I'd say if anybody else is in a similar situation, if you're logged on but not um, under a name that's identifiable uh, with uh, your yourself, then then please do let us know so that we can give you appropriate credit. I just made note of that, so I. Uh, so it will count as uh, the same person. Thanks. Andy. You could also put your name in the chat too, which would help document that. Any other um, questions, comments? About any of these pests or. Go ahead, Kat. Hi, uh, I was at a recent DEP stakeholders meeting for the new plan for waste and compost came up. And one of the things that's an issue is uh, yard waste. And so I was wondering how that mm -hmm. coincides with what you're doing as far as the spread of invasive species, where we see people putting branch clippings and uh, grass clippings and leaves and stuff into these paper bags, and then they get taken wherever they get taken. Is there any kind of like um, signage that warns people about using that or if somehow putting it through a compost pile or system or chipping it will eradicate the species in the compost? It seems like a lot of people think that compost is healthy and are kind of a, not aware that they may contain invasive species or pesticides or herbicides or even pet feces and things like that. So I was wondering um, if this might be a way, you know, that things are inadvertently being passed on to yard to yard in, in different areas. So we work together with uh, uh, Mark King at the DEP and others that uh, are on the compost team. For most of these pests, if the, the wood is chipped, um, we, we don't regulate that because it does pretty much damage most of the insect pests that uh, you know might be a problem what is being uh, passed around in compost are jumping worms and that's a uh, an issue that we're trying to address through a, a multi-agency multi um work group that gets together on a regular basis and we're also working with cornell university U umass U university of vermont and and um, a few others to try to figure out, you know, the extent of jumping worms in Maine. Uh, we found them in 13 of 16 counties now, and so they're fairly widespread. But we also know that they are showing up in municipal composts as well as in other yard debris. And I think that's the probably the number one pest that is uh, a potential threat and issue from from composts or mulches or leaf debris or or something like that. Um, you know, certainly pet waste could be an issue and, you know, maybe some pesticides, but probably as they go through the, the composting process, those those materials are broken down at 165 degree Fahrenheit and, you know, sometimes hotter than that in 
commercial composting um, processes, but it um, it is something that's a concern. We've been working on developing best management practices for those folks that are making those kinds of soil materials, and hopefully we can slow the spread of things like jumping worms, especially into the forest where they are definitely a, a big issue and um, even in you know some people's gardens. Any other questions? I guess, Gary, I just reiterate that this um, this meeting is not a public hearing. And so if you do have comments right. on the rules to make sure that you either um, send those written comments to Gary or um, join us for the public hearing next week. Good point. Thank you. Any other last questions? Well, thank you for attending and, and trying to stay informed on this. It's really important that you are all out there helping us to you know keep track of things like this because we're pretty small staffed and you know we don't have a, a lot of eyes and ears out there. We we rely a lot on all of you folks to to be looking for these potentially invasive pests that are already here or might show up. And anytime that there is a a new infestation or a new um, county that's being infested, the, the sooner we know about it, the better in terms of trying to keep track of it and try to slow the spread of, of all of these different types of invasive species. And so we thank you all for attending today and for staying informed. And, you know, please, if you have any concerns or questions about anything you're seeing and you, you, know, you don't know if it's invasive, it's best to just speak up and let us know. We'd, we'd rather get a, a spurious um, report than to not get a report at all and then end up having it be something that we didn't know about. And um, again, early detection and rapid response is, is extremely important. And you'll hear us say that over and over again. So you're the, you're the early detectors for us. And, and thanks a lot for, for being here. Anything to add, Allison? Well, that's it. Thanks, everybody. Right. Thanks for coming.